The proceeding will start shortly. 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 Southampton North and the Honourable Member for Strangford for their support and as co-sponsors of this debate. Now, the UN International Day for Disabled People falls on the 3rd of December during Disability History Month. And I use the term disabled people as opposed to people with disabilities as I am a firm advocate of the social model of disability as it is the disabling barriers in society which limit opportunities and prevent full and equal participation. The day is an opportunity... Yes. Thank you, Honourable Lady, for giving way and congratulating her for securing this debate today. The public sector equality duty requires public authorities to make considerations to the impact of their policies on people with disabilities with protected characteristics like disabilities at the policy development stage. Does the Honourable Member share in concerns that this could be used merely as a box-ticking exercise and that ministers should look at ways to make these considerations more naturally ingrained in processes? I thank the Honourable Lady for her intervention, and she's absolutely right. When it comes to uh, the, these exercises, they should never be seen as just a tick box, but actually have meaningful uh, value. Now, the day is an opportunity to celebrate the advancements and achievements of disabled people. For example, the Purple Pound shows the contributions we actually make to our society. Now, for decades, there have been many moments of celebrations of many of the achievements that we have made. And in just the last year, we saw Rose Ailing Ellis winning Strictly, the annual Disability Power 100 list featuring many people across different sectors, and just yesterday, the first disabled person to join the European Space Agency's astronaut program. Now, the day also presents an opportunity to highlight the many barriers that still exist in society and, re and redouble our efforts to protect and promote the human and civil rights of disabled people. It was the last Labour government that signed up to the UN Convention, which aims to eliminate discrimination, enable disabled people to live independently and protect against all forms of violence, abuse and exploitation. Sadly, 13 years later, the Convention is yet to be fully incorporated into UK law. Madam Deputy Speaker, 669 people contributed to this debate by sharing their experiences, which demonstrates just how important it is. And I want to thank each and every one of those people and acknowledge their moving, thoughtful and detailed contributions which have helped me to prepare for today. It is important to recognise that for many respondents, 60% of whom were disabled, completing a survey like this may have taken a lot of time and effort and not to mention the emotional energy. I also want to thank deaf and disabled people across the country, including people like Ellen Clifford, the Disabled People's Organisations Forum and charities including Disability Rights UK, SCOPE and the RNIB, along with the many others who have provided invaluable input. There are 14 million disabled people in the UK and a further 6 million carers who are represented by members from across the House. An accessible, inclusive and equitable society is what we all are striving for. However, discrimination, social barriers and government policies have significantly limited disabled people's ability to participate fully 
and independently. And I'm going to briefly outline just some of those areas. Now, to begin with, we have the disability employment gap, which has remained stubbornly around the 30% mark for more than a decade. And the TUC research also shows that the disability pay gap is over 70%, and that gender exacerbates it. Now, it is clear that those societal barriers still exist, which prevent many from accessing good quality work. Now, I know we all agree that everyone deserves to live in a safe, decent, warm and affordable housing. Yet only 9% of housing stock is accessible and disabled people are significantly more likely to live in unsafe accommodation. And that is why I have been calling on the government to implement the recommendation from the Grenfell Inquiry that would mandate landlords to prepare personal emergency evacuation plans, or PEEPs, for disabled people living in high-rise blocks. Now, too often, disabled people continue to face barriers when travel travelling, whether that's because of floating bus stops, cuts to bus services, inaccessible rail stations, and the closure of many ticket offices. They continue to hamper the ability of disabled people to travel independently. Now, when it comes to health, Madam Deputy Speaker, the pandemic shone a light on the stark health inequalities and barriers. Nearly 60% of COVID deaths were of disabled people or those with a long-term health condition. And then there was also the horrific blanket application of the DNAR notices that were applied during the early part of the pandemic. Now, in last week's autumn statement, the government decided to shelve its social care reforms and delay the introduction of the social care cap. A third of working age disabled people rely on that social care cap, and many of those are also in the social care charge debt. Disabled people have been disproportionately affected by government cuts, and this is, there is mounting evidence showing that real terms reductions in health and social care spending since 2010 may have led to thousands of excess deaths amongst disabled people. Now, the Disability Benefits Consortium found that there are more that they were more adversely affected or impacted by cuts to social security as a result of the conditionality regime. And there is also the unfit for purpose assessment framework. Now we know the government has spent over £120 million fighting personal independence payments and employment and support allowance appeals between 2017 and 2019. But yet 70% of PIP and 57% of ESA tribunals resulted in successful outcomes, which demonstrates that there is something wrong with the framework along with decision making. Now, just recently, the Information Commissioner ruled that the DWP unlawfully breached the Freedom of Information Act by preventing the release of internal process review reports into the deaths of at least 20 Social Security benefit claimants. And I do hope when the Minister responds today, he might give light as to when the Government will be publishing the report. Now, it's clear the Government didn't want to publish it, as it shows just the negative impact some of its policies has had on people that are claiming Social Security. But we all must remember the premise of Social Security. It is there as a safety net and support those in need. Madam Deputy Speaker, 4 million disabled people are living in, po in poverty and the current economic emergency will only worsen these inequalities as we face extra, as some should I say face, extra costs of around £600 a month. Now many know that my experience, but also before coming to this place, I have worked around the disability rights movement and I can safely say that there is no question that the last 12, 13 years of the hostile environment 
R as a result of cuts, R as a result of an assault on disabled people's civil and human rights, which has had a devastating impact. And this is evidenced by the UK becoming the first nation state to face an investigation under the Convention for its violations of disabled people's human rights. Now, their national disability strategy published last year was also sadly ruled unlawful. Many of us didn't believe that it was credible in the first place, but it speaks to the wider issue that the government must take heed of the mantra, nothing about us without us, and commit to co-producing and co-creating policies with deaf and disabled people. I hope that when the Minister responds, he will address some of the points that I've raised, but also some of the following points. Firstly, why hasn't the government committed to full incorporation of the Convention? It has been 13 years. Hate crime against disabled people rose by 43% in the year ending March 2022. So why does the government refuse to follow the Law Commission's recommendation and Labour's policy to make sure that disability is classed as an aggravated offence, which would ensure everybody is treated equally under the law. Now, if they are serious about getting people into work, why won't they commit to mandatory disability pay gap reporting, as is the case for the Labour Party? Now, the Access to Work scheme has the potential to be one of the best forms of employment support. I have been a recipient of it in the past, and many others have. But I believe it could be enhanced by removing the support, the support cap and creating a more streamlined process mm. that also includes portable passports. Yeah, yeah. And I will say, so will the government commit to doing this? Now, on to the disability confidence scheme, or as I sometimes choose to call it, not so confident, as we need to have confidence in this scheme. The current scheme doesn't make it mandatory for anyone that is found to be a disability com confident employer to actually employ any disabled people. So I would like to ask the Minister, will they commit to introducing an independent evaluation, monitoring and quality controls so that the scheme can be given the credibility that it needs to have for people to want to be part of it? Now, in this economic crisis, the additional £150 disability cost of living payment announced in the statement last week is clearly not enough. When inflation is at a 40-year high, so we need to understand what additional targeted support is going to be available to people. Also, with winter fast approaching, when will these cost of living payments actually be made? And will the government consider also reversing the eligibility criteria for the Warm Homes Discount Scheme, which, which saw over 300,000 disabled people moved out of the scheme as they no longer qualify? Now, finally, I just want to end by remembering two former colleagues and friends that passed away very recently. So the fearless late campaigner, Sean McGovern, who was a staunch disability rights campaigner, but also a strong trade union ca uh, champion um, for disabled people's rights, but also he was a mentor to me, and it was him that who encouraged me to put myself forward for public office. But for his continued encouragement and support, I may not be here today. But I also want to pay tribute to the late Roger Lewis, who passed away just this week um, from bowel cancer. He, again, was a strong supporter, but also he changed and touched the lives of so many disabled people, so many deaf people, and so many blind and partially sighted people. He himself was totally blind, but that never stopped him from being a champion and an advocate for the rights of disabled people. And our movement is poorer without them. But as we go forward to mark the UN International Day of Disabled People, let us also remember just the amazing achievements that so many of us are making and continue to make, 
but also recognising the many challenges and the many barriers that we must overcome to create that full, inclusive, accessible and equitable society within which we all seek and strive to be part of. Thank you. The question is, as on the order paper, uh, Sir Stephen Timms. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I do um, welcome the initiative my honourable friend has taken in uh, applying and obtaining this uh, debate. And I want to pick up a number of the important points that she made in an excellent speech. But I just wanted to begin, Madam Deputy Speaker, by commenting about the, the problem the government has over engagement with disabled people. We know that po poverty is particularly focused amongst families living with disability. That's very clear, for example, in the work of the Social Metrics Commission, chaired by the noble Baroness Stroud, who was once the special advisor to the Right Honourable Member for Chingford when he was Secretary of State. So this is not a, a partisan point uh, at all. Poverty is focused amongst those uh, families. So it's not surprising that disabled people, from time to time, have cause to criticise the benefit system. And the DWP has tended, in the last few years in particular, I think, to respond to that by kind of pulling up the drawbridge and refusing to talk properly with people. And that led to the fiasco that my honourable friend referred to of the disability strategy, launched with some fanfare in July of last year and then declared unlawful in January this year because of the failing in consultation with uh, disabled people, and as far as I know, it's still languishing, uh, stuck, uh, gone nowhere um, as, a, uh, as, as a consequence. The Social Security Advisory Committee uh, is appointed by the government. It contains experts, not politicians. It's chaired at the moment by Stephen O'Brien, who was one of the original architects with the Centre for Social Justice of Universal Credit. And they produced a useful paper in December 2020 called How DWP uh, Involves Disabled People When Developing or Evaluating Programmes That Affect Them. Slightly long-winded title, but I think it's clear what it's about. And, and their, their report says this. DWP officials themselves acknowledge that the department is not trusted by many disabled people and by some of the organisations who are led by or work with disabled people. Our own research confirmed this. Some of the individuals we spoke to did not believe that the department engaged with disabled people's organisations or sought views from individual disabled people. There was also a widespread belief that DWP would not represent accurately disabled people's views when they did seek them. So the, the committee uh, recommended uh, that, I quote, DWP should develop a clear protocol for engagement. It should cover both national and local engagement. A clear, straightforward, I think constructive and helpful suggestion to try and overcome this very serious problem. But the department's response was simply to reject it. Recommendation rejected, the response said. The committee also recommended the department should routinely report on its engagement with disabled people. The department rejected that as well. I quote, we believe that our existing reporting provides sufficient information on our engagement with disabled people and, and stakeholders. But uh, I must say, Madam Deputy Speaker, that is not the view of disabled people. And indeed, a Conservative member of the House of Lords, the noble Lord Shinquin, told the Select Committee that, and I quote, the DWP is handling its engagement with disabled people badly, and he, and he went on to refer to the engagement uh, as being handled, quote, with palpable disrespect. Uh, and we now know it's not the view of the courts either, hence the fiasco over the disability strategy. Uh, the department commissioned a report from an external, a uh, very respected external agency, uh, to investigate the experiences of disabled people of the benefit system. And it uh, talked to quite a large number of disabled people in order to carry out this research, and it, it told each of them, when asking if they'd take part in the study, 
that the results would be published, the report would be published. Uh, when ministers saw the report, however, they decided not to publish it. That is a very clear breach of the cross-government protocol on social research, uh, which does require documents like that to be published. And actually, what the select committee did was to use its powers to obtain a copy of the report from the authors, and we published it. So it did then reach the, the public um, domain. But it's true, of course, that being open about criticisms and, and difficulties does expose ministers to awkward questions. But refusing open discussion, trying to keep things secret, trying to keep the lid on things, does far more damage than letting these debates take place in the open. And I, I warmly welcome the new minister to his post and his colleagues in the <laughs> ministerial team. And I really hope they will take this opportunity to have a fresh look at this question, at how they deal with, how they talk to, how they engage with disabled people and their organisations. Because the practice of the, 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 the team led by the, the previous Secretary of State, I, I think, was disastrous and quite unnecessarily. There was no need to try and hide all these things. It would be far less damaging to be open and, and yes, sometimes have a robust exchange, but to try and keep it all hidden was <coughs> very, very damaging and counterproductive. And as a first step on this, um, we've been told by the department that it is not going to publish the numbers of work capability assessments that it carries out each month. I have no idea why that isn't going to be published. It's absolutely basic and fundamental data. Uh, well, I suppose the reason is that if people know how many are being carried out, they're going to ask awkward questions about what's going on. But it's, it, it's an, another example of this very damaging and counterproductive attempt <coughs> to, to bury what's really happening. Will they give way? I, I'm glad to give way. I'm sorry, I came, late, I came late to the debate because I was delayed in traffic. Another meeting. But can I remind my right, right honourable friend, some of, the, um, some of the concerns that have been expressed by disabled organisations over the years commenced largely around the WCA, yeah. when the, if I remember the honourable gentleman doing, including a number of us, when we were simply asking the DWP, were they monitoring, for example, the consequences and the impact of the WCA on certain vulnerable people mm -hmm. and the suicides that yeah. were taking yeah. place. Yeah. They denied us that knowledge at that point yeah. in time. So you can yeah. understand why a number of disability organisations are sceptical about the role of the department itself. Yes, I, I think my right honourable friend is absolutely <coughs> right. There is quite a long history to this. But my, my sense is that in the last few years it's got considerably worse. The department has stopped publishing things that obviously no, should be published and, and, and answering perfectly reasonable questions, and I think it has <coughs> very badly damaged its reputation with disabled people as a result. And I, I, I very much hope that the new ministerial team will want to rebuild those, those links and, and rebuild yeah. trust. Um, my honourable friend uh, made some very important points about the uh, disability people would like to work but can't, and that gap has, has increased in the last two quarters. There's been a, a damaging impact, I think, from the, the pandemic, uh, a steep rise in the number of people uh, since the pandemic who've been out of work on health grounds. We urgently need to be able to support disabled people who would like to work into jobs as one of the, the key opportunities to tackle the, the current labour shortage. There's a big uh, opportunity there that we can take advantage of. So in July last year, the Select Committee published its report on the disability employment gap. Shortly before the 2015 general election, David Cameron announced a target to halve the disability employment gap. Uh, that target was scrapped shortly after the 2015 general election. We want it reinstated. Yeah. Um, our report called for a, a radical overhaul of employment support for disabled people. The, the big national work and health programme is, is helpful, but it's not working for many people. And the truth is, and I think we can all recognise this, that smaller specialist providers are often best placed to deliver 
the help that's needed. And you have to be on the ground locally to know who can do the best job. You can't commission that kind of support from Whitehall. So we propose that funding for this employment support should be devolved. Where the capacity exists, we want groups of local authorities, probably based on the new NHS integrated care system boundaries, to be responsible for commissioning and delivering employment support for disabled people. The department should allocate funding, should monitor performance, should publish detailed comparative performance data, but shouldn't itself deliver the support. The support should be closely integrated with uh, the, the health service locally, with colleges and uh, voluntary sector groups um, uh, as well. Uh, in its response to our report, the, the department didn't reject that idea, but it's not moved in that direction at all since, I think. I, I very much hope that it, that it will. My honourable friend was right in what she said about access to work. That's vital to overcoming work-related work -related obstacles resulting from uh, disability. It's a lifeline for many. But it's not well enough known. Many employers don't know about it. And it is dogged, as my honourable friend said, by a bureaucratic and extraordinarily cumbersome application process which puts people off and, and leaves many in limbo while once they do apply they then have to wait quite a long time sometimes to find out what support they're going to receive. If somebody benefits from access to work in one job and then changes job they've got to go back to square one. There should be a passporting arrangement as my honourable friend argued. Um, if they apply for a new job their potential new employer at the moment can't be certain in advance what if any help access to work will provide. The, the Minister's predecessor told the Select Committee about a planned digital transformation for access to work, which I hope will address these obvious failings, and I hope the Department will involve disabled people themselves in a, in a, a redesign of the access to work programme. And I'd be particularly grateful if the Minister, in winding up, could give us an update on the, the progress of that uh, initiative. Yes, I agree. Um, thank, I thank the honourable member for giving way, and he's making some really powerful points. Would you agree with me that uh, where uh, there's a limit on individual, uh, ca a cap on individual benefits through the access to work scheme, that stops some people getting everything they deserve, while there's money left lying in other pools? for this purpose. The Honourable Lady is, is quite right, and my Honourable Friend in opening made that point uh, as well, and I, I, I think that's, that's unhelpful and it should be removed. We also called uh, in our report for larger employers to be required to publish the proportion of their employees who are disabled, and uh, my Honourable Friend uh, referred rightly to disability pay gap reporting and, and like her, the Select Committee thinks that there is, it's high time for a rig rigorous evaluation of the well-intentioned Disability Confident Scheme. Um, for our current inquiry, we conducted a survey of uh, personal independence payment and employment and support allowance claimants. And my honourable friend has referred to the experiences of some of those applicants as well. We are going to be publishing our report from that inquiry soon. But it was striking how many respondents to that inquiry, uh, to that survey, said that the assessments had damaged their mental health. Uh, they described the assessments. Many respondents said that they were humiliating, they were undignified, or even in some cases that they were traumatic. Yeah. Uh, there's a serious backlog at the moment for personal independence application well, applications. Yes, I'm glad to give one. Can I, can I thank my right friend um, for, for giving way? But he's making a really interesting point about the negative and also long-lasting impact um, that the assessment frameworks for, for employment and support allowance are PIP is having. And would he agree with me that now is the time to actually overhaul these assessment frameworks to something that is co-created with disabled people, but that is less intrusive and really focuses on providing the essential support and the extra cost of living support that is needed. I, I agree with my own honourable friend. There is a big job to be done, and I think involving disabled people in doing it would be a, a very important part of the, the solution. Uh, there's also a backlog at the moment for industrial injuries disablement benefit. Uh, and it remains the case, as my honourable friend has pointed out, that when people appeal against an adverse 
PIP decision, the great majority win their appeal, which shows pretty clearly that there's something going badly wrong at the, 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 at the moment. The department did introduce some welcome uh, imaginative flexibility in assessments during the pandemic, and I pay tribute to those who came up with some new ways of doing things when obviously the old ways couldn't be uh, applied during the, the pandemic. Telephone assessments, video assessments, uh, and in taking advantage of uh, those long term, I think it's quite important to, to maintain flexibility. So for some people, able to be assessed at home over the telephone or, or via a video link avoids an enormous amount of distress. It's a real boon. But for others, it is important to be able to talk about their impairment face to face and they're happy to travel to an assessment centre in order to do so. I don't think there's a kind of single solution here, but the, the, the flexibility that's been introduced uh, uh, of late will be valuable, I think. Um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission is in negotiation with the department on a, a Section 23 agreement over the protection of vulnerable claimants arising from grave concern that we've heard about already about claimants who've been badly treated by the department, too often having lost their benefits or being sanctioned when the issue was, for example, a known and serious mental health problem. Uh, too many benefit claimants have, as we've already been reminded, taken their lives in these circumstances. So I, I welcome the initiative that the Equality and Human Rights Commission has taken, and I very much hope that the Section 23 agreement will be concluded and, and published soon. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, the new ministerial team has the chance, I think, to establish a, a new, much more positive relationship with disabled people based on openness in place of defensiveness. And I, I do urge, the, in, in welcoming the, the new minister to his post, I urge him to take that opportunity. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I, uh, first of all, think, say uh, a big thank you to the Honourable Lady for Battersea for, for setting the scene so very well. I was very pleased to go to the Backbench Committee with the Honourable Lady and others uh, to request the, the debate because it's a very, very important debate. It's one that I feel I'm particularly strongly about, and, 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 and I'm very happy to be in the Chamber today to seek uh, support along the lines that the Honourable Lady and the Honourable Gentleman for East Hammonds referred to as well, because it's really, really important to have this issue. In place. Can I just say, um, uh, the Honourable Lady, in her introduction, Mr. Our Madam Deputy Speaker referred to Roger Lewis uh, and, and said that he was, uh, for the Honourable Lady, that he was the encouragement for her to be here. And just say, Madam Deputy Speaker, I mean, honestly, to, to the Honourable Lady and everyone here, uh, it's, that's a man who has, has blessed us with the Honourable Lady's uh, presence, so we're very pleased uh, that he was able to encourage her and that we, as a, as a result, have the benefit. Of, of the powers that the Honourable Lady quite clearly has. Um, I, I am um, Vice Chair of the APPG uh, on eyesight and eye care. The Honourable Lady leads it. She leads it well. Uh, yesterday, the Honourable Lady was not able to be there. She asked me to, to substitute. I, I said to all those that were around, uh, the Honourable Lady is the really person that can do it much better than me. I will never be able to chair the meetings as well as her. But uh, yesterday, I think everyone recognised that. So. <laughs> 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 can, I, can I find an honourable member for Giveaway, but also to thank him for, for his stellar leadership of that group prior to me taking over as chair, but also for stepping in always for me um, at, at the last minute. And I know he chaired that meeting really well. <laughs> you're, you're, you're most kind. I, I hope that was the case. <laughs> but I'm, I'm really pleased to, to be here to um, speak. And I'm also vice chair of the uh, in this place, Madam Deputy Speaker, you, you, I chair many APPGs and probably vice chair of, of numerous other ones. Which, uh, uh, but I, I am also vice chair of the APPG on disability. So it's always great to be here and promote the rights and well-being of those with disabilities and their contribution to all of the aspects of our society, educationally, socially, culturally, politically. And as my party's a, a health spokesperson, uh, I will always stand up for those with disabilities. Because I want to see a society. Uh, it's not wrong. That we, I think the minister will want to see a society as well. I think we all do in this house, to be, to be fair. See a society that recognises achievement and ability and doesn't look upon somebody who just happens to have a disability, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I find uh, um, quite disappointing for some of the people that we meet in life. Uh, and we do meet them uh, on, on a regular basis. It's always good to see the shadow minister in her place. 
and 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 New Zealand a great a great uh, experience and, and, and capability. So we'll look forward to our contribution and, and to my honourable friend, the, the spokesperson for the Scots Nats Party, who always is here whenever we're having debates. The minister, uh, welcome to his place. Um, look forward to the answers that we seek uh, today. I, I think this is, uh, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, is, is an open door request. I, I really do believe that. Uh, and I think it's very hard to say no to the requests that we're making on behalf of those uh, who are disabled. So we look forward to, to, to the Minister's contribution as well. The latest estimates from the Family Resources Survey indicate that 14.6 million people in the UK had a disability in the 2021 financial year. This represents some 22% of the total population and one of five, one of five uh, of the population in Northern Ireland. So it's important to remember, Madam Deputy Speaker, the range of disabilities and the impairments that people suffer with. Some are not physical, uh, for instance, like, like autism or, or bipolar disorder. Um, I'm not smarter than anybody else, Madam Deputy Speaker, but I understand these things because of my direct contact with my constituents. And we have a, a, a large proportion of, of, of constituents come to see us about disability issues. <coughs> Some uh, are also not noticeable, for instance, like fibromyalgia. You can't see it in the hands when they come in and present themselves, but they can tell you about it and uh, just how bad that is for, for many of my constituents. And it almost features in nearly every one of the applications for PIPs, for personal independence payments that I do in my office. So, so I, I, again, I'm not an expert, far from it, but I do understand. But regardless of that, we have continued to ask for respect for how someone's disability impacts their daily life. I want disabled people to be recognised for their ability, for their achievement, and not for their disability. Mm-hmm. One of my staff members did specifically with benefit queries in my office at DLA, will it be children's DLA, will it be PIPs, uh, income support or ESA. They, they're all the most prominent forms of benefit claimed. And we never truly know just how different disabilities can affect one's mobility and getting around. Um, I, I, my, my staff member does it uh, five days a week and does nothing else but benefits. That gives you an idea of the magnitude of the issue. I, I try uh, as a member of parliament, but also because uh, as a, 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 a physically active uh, member of parliament, I fill the application forms in as well. So uh, then that gives you an understanding of, of, of the benefit and how we are dealing with that. So I generally, uh, uh, and, and that I believe gives me an understanding of how life at present is so different. Um, and I think, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm going to speak about the RNIB, I know they're not referred to it, but I think it's also important because they, they refer to the energy um, and uh, price rises, to, to food price in, increases. Uh, and while we as an able bodied uh, in this chamber uh, are able to, to um, budget and and, and cut the cloth accordingly. Um, and many people here disabled don't have that ability, so we need to have. Must, must I ask this question if I can? I will ask it later on again. But uh, what can be done to help those people who have disabilities in particular uh, when it comes to dealing with these things? Um, the Honourable Lady uh, for Battersea also referred to the, the tribunal success. Uh, the Honourable Gentleman for East Ham uh, also uh, referred to it as well. I think, as as I know in our office, we, we have a 75 to 80 percent success rate when it comes to benefit tribunal um, uh, uh, that, that, we, that we do, and all those different uh, benefits. But I think that indicates perhaps, and I always say this gently to the people, because I understand um, that people make decisions on what they have on paper in front of them. And sometimes when you have a face-to-face with the person in a tribunal, you can see things very, very differently. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes the tribunal sees things differently. It also gives you a chance to bring forward the, the medical evidential base uh, to, to back that up. Um, and these are perhaps things that could be done in the process as we go forward. But nonetheless, it's a pleasure to represent people and the, and the, uh, for the, the things that they need us to do. On the 24th of September 2022, the Minister for Communities in Northern Ireland announced work would begin on a new social inclusion strategy, including a disability strategy, which aims to promote positive attitudes towards disabled people and ensure their inclusion in society. I really welcome that, Madam Deputy Speaker. I think it's good to do that, uh, and, and, we, and we should be focused on how we can do it better. Um, um, don't uh, see the disability, see the person, see the, the potential for that person to achieve and do well. That's what I want. That's what I hope to see. I think, Madam Deputy Speaker, at the end of the day, they, and I say this with respect, they are human beings just like everyone else. 
the RNIB, the Royal National Institute of Blind People, have been in contact with my office, as I know they did contact the, 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 the Honourable Lady for Battersea and, and others as well within this chamber, um, ha, have made it clear that the cost of living crisis is becoming increasingly difficult with people with disabilities. They have stated that, and I quote it, uh, more than two-thirds of people with disabilities said their financial situation had gotten worse and more than a third often go without essentials such as food and heating and struggle to make ends meet. So, Minister, the question I was uh, hoping that you might be able to answer for me, sorry, sorry, the Minister may be able to answer, apologies, uh, um, was the one, uh, what can we do to assist those, those people with disabilities when it comes to the, the, the energy crisis, to the food um, increases, uh, just to everything in life which seems to be getting more and more expensive? It's a big ask. To the, to the Minister, but it is one that I would like to yeah, happy to give way. Yeah. Uh, I thank the Honourable Member for giving way, and uh, the Honourable Lady and the Honourable Gentleman have both mentioned RNIB yeah. and, and people with uh, a disability with sight. A real concern I know that many constituents have raised with me is the confidence from some taxi drivers at turning away passengers with guide dogs, which is of course illegal, but they struggle to see the consequences for this as it continues to happen. So does the Honourable Member agree that this is something that governments across the UK should be tackling together to, to, to stop? As often, uh, whether it be in this House or whether it be in Westminster Hall, the Honourable Lady brings forward a, a, a salient reminder of, of the issue. And I have to say that back home, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, and I, I have some of my constituents who still, even if it's illegal, as the Honourable Lady has referred to, it's still been happening and, and it's still happening in certain parts. And I don't understand the logic to it because uh, those, those guide dogs are, 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 are some of the best that I've seen. I remember uh, one time, many, many years ago, uh, the Royal Institute for the uh, Na National Institute for the Blind uh, took me to Hollywood in, 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 in Northern Ireland uh, and they gave me a guide dog. And, and they let me walk through Hollywood High Street with a mask on. And I couldn't see a thing. It was pure, pure darkness. Mm -hmm. I have to say, um, it was one of probably my um, uh, better experiences when it comes to understanding how it is for someone. Now, you have to say, that, that I didn't know the guide dog. The guide dog didn't know me. <laughs> but the guide dog stuck to my, to my knee mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and took me and, and negotiated the whole way down the high street. It's a busy high street. There's obstructions in the high street. There's people have coffee tables and all that. But we able to, you know, and come to a foot pass where you didn't know what was going on, but the dog did. Um, so I have to say that that, that was one of, one of my uh, fond memories, if I can say that, uh, and helped me to understand better what it means to be blind and, 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 and the importance of it. The, the uh, encouraging disabled people uh, into education and employment is something I feel very strong about, Madam Deputy Speaker. The most recent Labour Force survey <coughs> out showed that some 38.9% of people with a disability in Northern Ireland were employed in 2020, compared to 78.4% of people who were not disabled. Wow, that's a big, big factor to try and address. That's, we need to squeeze that, uh, um, uh, the opportunity for those with uh, disability to enable them to, to stand alongside those who are, 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 are not disabled and able to work. The, the Honourable Lady also uh, referred, and, 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 and again, so an issue comes up in my office regularly, and that's a big accommodation. Um, Many times we'll have people coming in who are in benefits and have mobility issues, and they might have been in an upstairs flat or, or a house with stairs, uh, and that was okay when they weren't disabled. But as, as life has progressed, they become disabled. Uh, therefore, that property is no longer suitable for them. So, so it's a regular issue, uh, and it's also a regular issue for those who perhaps maybe uh, find themselves in wheelchairs, uh, and you, they, then you need a disabled uh, disabled grant uh, for a home. Uh, which uh, probably involves, uh, in many <coughs> cases, uh, quite extensive uh, uh, changes to the doorways, to a ramp to the front of the house, a ramp to the rear of the house, perhaps, uh, a, a walk-in shower, uh, a bathroom, and all on a level. Uh, so, so those are things that maybe we, we need to be looking at as well. So, uh, again, um, <coughs> I, I, I can, I'm thinking of the rates of those with dis disabilities uh, who are disabled and employment have, have uh, incrementally uh, increased which is a great sign that there, that there is more public encouragement and awareness uh, for people who are disabled uh, uh, and, and are just as capable as doing the jobs. <coughs> can the Minister outline uh, what steps can be taken? Uh, my, 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 my request, Minister, will, will always be in a constructive fashion. I, I mean that, because I, I, I look for the answers. Uh, for the solutions, and, and I know that's what the minister wants as well. But what's, what steps will be taken to encourage employers 
to, to employ those who are, are disabled. And many of the, uh, the disabled people that I meet, Madam Deputy Speaker, are people with incredible intelligence, incredible ability. Uh, IT skills are, are with, well, I'm not IT, uh, I'm no good at IT skills. I, I make a confession in the chamber. But I tell you what, some of the people that I meet are absolutely first class and they could do a job as well or not better. So what can we do, Minister, to increase that uh, and, and, and a way that, that uh, makes your life better for them? Another issue uh, that needs to be addressed, Madam Deputy Speaker, is the disability pay gap. Others, mm. both speakers have, have referred to it because it seems like if you're disabled, your time in employment, and I say this gently, is worth less than anyone else. Well, it shouldn't be. So what are we doing to, to address that issue? Uh, I think the employers sometimes need to understand that, that don't, don't look at the person, look at the ability, look at the power and, 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 the, and the, they, they have to achieve the issue. Disability employment gap in Northern Ireland in 2020 was 42.2 per person compared to 27.9 for the rest of the UK. It's not the Minister's responsibility directly, but I would ask, and I know, he, I know the Minister will do that, of course, uh, has there been any opportunity to have discussions with the, the, the equivalent Minister in Northern Ireland? It's always good to share stories. It's always good to share experiences, because I think sometimes we can learn. I can learn. I always learn from things, but I, I believe our Ministers can learn how they have fallen short, whereas here it, it's, it's better. So how, how can we do that to make it better? Uh, and, and to have that experience. In addition to this, Madam Deputy Speaker, there are some disabilities that aren't recognised through the benefit systems as disabilities. For example, uh, endometriosis and asthma, uh, as two, have only recently been recognised as disabilities for PIP and assessments, uh, despite them being long or life-term conditions which, which uh, disable one from everyday tasks. Those are issues that we have uh, uh, many times. There must be proper consensus carried out within the departments to ascertain what a, dis a disability is. Many, many years ago, um, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, I, I um, um, uh, was first brought to the attention of ME and MS. In those days, uh, very often the doctor did not quite understand what ME or MS was. And although I could see quite clearly the person uh, and, and, and the medical evidence that they had uh, from a consultant point of view, showed that there was a, there was a disability, but, but unfortunately the GP, it's not a criticism, Mr Deputy Speaker, by the way, uh, it's about how we move on and we learn things, uh, and, and they didn't really sometimes have an understanding. But today MS and ME are recognised as two of the disabilities, uh, and they uh, include incredible fatigue and pain, uh, and, and again, things that, that should always be recognised, but they are today recognised as a disability. Not many persons who have, have, has a disability can work at the same time are not always entitled to benefits. I believe the best way to encourage people, or uh, disabled people, into work is to take the stigma away. As many disabled people are forced to challenge stereotypes and prejudice when they are looking for work. I, I welcomed in the in the autumn budget, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I, I do it genuinely because I think it's a, it's a positive step um, to uh, help those that are on benefits um, to to uh, um, try and get back into work because I think many of them want to work. Uh, and, and, and they should be encouraged and helped along that pathway um, uh, as long as they're able to and, 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 and can do that. So again, that was one of the good things that came out of the, the autumn budget. To conclude, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, disability inclusion is an essential condition to upholding human rights, sustainable development and peace and security. They're no different from us. I said it before, I said it again. And the United Nations Disability Inclusion Strategy, which uh, is part of the headline for this particular debate, um, provides a foundation for sustainable and transformative progress on disability inclusion through all pillars of the work of the United Nations. So we must, in this House, all of us, uh, work on disability inclusion within our own constituencies in mine and Strangford and across this great United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, through employment, through education uh, and, and through society to promote inclusion of all, equality and fairness in our modern society. Wouldn't it be wonderful, Mr Devers? We always seek for wonderful things, and it's not wrong to do so. If disabled people all across the society could have those issues as a key part of their employment, of their education, of their housing, of their health and their benefits. That's the purpose of this debate today. 
commend the Honourable Lady uh, and the Honourable Gentleman for, for their contributions. I look forward to others uh, very much so, and I look especially forward to the Minister. We'll sit you a long list of the Ask Minister, but we look forward to the answers. Thank you. Madam <laughs> Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and it's, as ever, a pleasure to follow the Honourable Member for Strangford. And I really, truly want to congratulate the Honourable Member for Battersea for securing this important debate. And I listened with great interest to the contribution from the Right Honourable Member for East Ham. I was going to say West, but I'm thinking football at the moment, so I hope you'll forgive me. Um, the Honourable Member for uh, Strangford says, yes, I'm always appearing in these debates, and it's because I am the SNP spokesperson for disabilities. But since I became that, uh, took on that role, I have really learned and learned to understand how important it is that we debate these subjects. So even if I cease to be that pe uh, spokesperson, I'll still be here. Because I think what we do and when we talk about people with disabilities, it's really, really important. And it's a privilege today, Mr Deputy Speaker, to mark the International Day of Persons with uh, Disabilities, the UN International Day, I should say, that falls on December the 3rd. And it's to promote the rights, dignity and well-being of people with disabilities across the globe. Disabled people are key members of society and they make a huge positive impact on the world we live in. And this huge impact has been embodied by the inspiring story of the former British Paralympian John McFall, who this week became the first disabled astronaut. Isn't that amazing? I also note it's Disability History Month, and there are a number of wonderful events taking place across Parliament, and I'll be speaking in one directly after this debate today, uh, organised by Parley Able. I would encourage my fellow parliamentarians to attend some of these events. People here probably will, but I'm sending this message further, first of the chamber, as we would say in Scotland, and as we celebrate the history of those with disabilities. In my role as spokesperson, I regularly meet with disabled people and organisations, and I'd like to pay tribute to those with disabilities and their carers who regularly offer inspiration to me personally. In line with the UN's uh, commitment to leave no one behind as part of their 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the UN have outlined that in moments of crisis, it is vulnerable people, such as those with disabilities, who are most often left behind and excluded. Around a billion people in the world live with a disability, with 80% of them living in developing countries with higher levels of disability amongst women, poor and the elderly. The significant cunt, uh, cut to the UK government aid budget has left a 4.6 billion black hole in the budget compared to 2019 and res has resulted in a significant reduction in the number and size of programmes targeted at disabled people. Many disabled people in developing countries will be impacted. For example, in Rwanda, where 150,000 girls and 50,000 boys, which includes 8,000 adolescents with disabilities, are no longer able to take part in an education and life skills programme. Mr Deputy Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic, as we have already heard, uh, had already deepened pre-existing inequalities in society, and the latest rise in inflation has disproportionately hurt the most vulnerable. This feeling of being left behind is something I've heard from many of the organisations I have met with recently. As many disabled people feel left behind by this current government in response to the ongoing cost of living crisis. This, this government's inadequate targeted measures have done very little in addressing the concerns of disabled people and their families who have much higher energy needs. Simply putting on another jumper or taking measures to limit the use of gas and electricity aren't feasible possibilities for those living with disabilities. Staying warm is essential for many disabled people, and many risk worsening their condition if they cut corners by simply not putting the heating on. 
Likewise, many disabled people simply can't cut corners with electricity as they need to change or charge or power essential life-saving equipment such as ventilators and wheelchairs. Chairs. Now, recently there was a Muscular Dystrophy UK drop-in event in Parliament, and I was shown a stark graphic that actually reinforces this point. A mother of a child with muscular dystrophy showed a picture of the six plugs needed to charge her child's life-saving equipment at any given time. For disabled people and their families, the choices between charging, heating and eating are impossible. And the position this government is putting the parents of disabled children into is totally unacceptable and devoid of any empathy. The parents of these children are certainly not reaping the rewards of so-called compassionate conservatism we hear so much about in this chamber. There's a, an example is the recent case of Carolyn and Freya Hunter, and it demonstrates the inadequacy of this government's targeted support. Carolyn, the mother of Freya, was facing an energy bill of £17,000 to keep Freya's life-saving equipment running. Fortunately, the actress, Kate Winslet, most kindly stepped in to cover their bills. But it is unacceptable that societies most vulnerable in the United Kingdom have to rely on philanthropy and the charitable nature of others to live with dignity. The UK's reliance on charity rather than government policy to ensure vulnerable people can survive this current crisis is also demonstrated by the increased use of food banks. The Trussell Trust have released research which shows that disabled people are hugely overrepresented in food poverty demographics, with 60% of food bank, food bank users having a disability. Poverty and disability are often mutually reinforcing, and almost half of all disabled people are planning not to turn their heating on, in spite of the reasons I gave for doing so. Do you want to intervene? Yeah. I'll give way to the, honour the right honourable gentleman. Um, the honourable lady mentioned the element of this before. One of the key issues is that any, if a family, as she says, has a person with disabilities in the, <coughs> within the family, it's almost a, a key factor in there for making sure that whole family then lives in poverty. Mm. And the key issue there, I chair a group of unpaid carers, the key issue there is no, the lack of support for unpaid carers yeah. and the yeah. low level of support allowance mm. for them. I totally agree with the right honourable gentleman, and I thank him for his intervention. I too, um, I am huge, hugely impressed and inspired by unpaid carers, many of whom save this country an absolute fortune and get no thanks for the help that they do. Um, so, could I take this opportunity on, on behalf of everyone here to thank them for what they do? Um, according to Scope, uh, millions of disabled people will be cold, hungry and at risk. Disabled people are at the sharp end of this cost of living crisis and government support so far has simply not been enough. A one-off cost of living payment to disabled people is inadequate as a form of uh, support. However, disabled people being left behind by this Conservative government is not a new phenomenon. The government's national disability strategy left, uh, last year left behind uh, the, the views of those with disabilities. Found to, it was found to be unlawful, as has already been made, and it just failed to adequately talk to live, those with lived experience of disabilities. In Scotland, we do that. Um, I've stood in this chamber and in the other in Westminster Hall and talked about what Scotland does. Please, Minister, look at what Scotland does because it's worth looking at. I've had disabled people here in Parliament come to me and say, I, I wish I lived in Scotland. You do it so much better. We're a small nation. This was part of Parts of the social security system are devolved, and with that de devolution, we are doing everything we possibly can to help people who are disabled and to treat them with fairness, dignity, and respect. And as the Honourable Member for East Ham said, 
We don't do that here. People are made to jump through hoops unnecessarily. Look at what we are doing and learn lessons, please. Certainly. Just make the point that the uh, Work and Pension Select Committee visited Glasgow and met with uh, senior officers of Social Security Scotland, and I think there's a great deal in the approach that she's advocating. I think she's right. The Minister would do well to take a look at that. I thank him for his uh, intervention. and I've spoken to many people who were previously employed by DWP in Scotland who say that the, the, they are so pleased uh, because they're able to contrast and compare the two regimes and they are so pleased to be working now for Social Security Scotland. Those with disabilities are fearful of being left behind once again with the return of the British Bill of Rights and the corresponding abolition of the Human Rights Act uh, if it's going forward in the parliamentary agenda. Its worrying re-emergence rekindles the fears of many disability organisations regarding the removal of statutory protections for those with disabilities at a time in which we should be strengthening the protections in place for those with disabilities to ensure that they can live with as few barriers as possible, this government risks regressing the regulatory regime for disability rights. The Human Rights Act offers a critically important mechanism for recourse for those with disabilities, and to abolish it would be to weaken avenues for those with disabilities to enforce their rights. So I'd welcome the Minister telling me I'm wrong and this isn't going to happen. I think we all would. The British Institute of Human Rights has drawn my attention uh, to a story um, highlighting the necessity of challenging inequality for disabled people using human rights legislation. Bryn was 60 years old and lived in supporting living. He had learning disabilities, epilepsy, was non-communicative and blind. Staff at the home became concerned that Bryn had a heart condition and called a doctor from the local NHS surgery who came to visit. Bryn had an independent mental capacity advocate who was supporting him. The advocate attended a multidisciplinary meeting to represent Bryn. At this meeting, the GP stated that he would not be arranging a heart sc uh, scan for Bryn as he has a learning disability and no quality of life. Bryn's advocate challenged this by raising Bryn's right to life, Article 2 in the Human Rights Act, and his right to be free from discrimination, Article 14. The advocate asked the doctor if he would arrange a heart scan if anyone else in the room was in this, in this situation, and the GP said yes, and then he agreed to arrange the scan. The Human Rights Act gave the advocate the legal grounds to challenge the discrimination and take steps to protect Bryn's life, but sadly Bryn passed away because of his heart condition before any treatment could take place. I'd like us all to reflect on that. And I want to thank um, the British Institute of Human Rights for bringing this to my attention. Uh, Clause 5 of the Rights Removal Bill destroys positive obligations, which is the positive duty on public officials to protect people from harm. The new bill allows public bodies to refuse to act to safeguard people like Bryn and to raise financial resources or operational priorities as a reasoning behind not taking action. Disability rights groups across the UK are gravely concerned that public officials won't take proactive steps to protect disabled people from harm due to discriminatory attitudes or the resources required to protect that person and that the Rights Removal Bill removes accountability for this. This is very, very dangerous and increases the likelihood of more awful stories like Bryn's occurring. Mr Deputy Speaker, I do want to complete this and I will beg a little indulgence. You'll be shaking your head at me. Okay. In uh, I will be very brief. 
In Scotland, we try to do dif different things differently in order to foster a more inclusive society for, uh, for all based on fairness, dignity and respect. Please heed these words. While constrained by the limits of the current constitutional arrangement and budget, the Scottish Government continues to put measures in place to remove barriers facing those with disabilities. We want everyone to reach their uh, uh, full potential. The Scottish Government has committed to introducing an overarching Scottish diversity and inclusion strategy covering Scotland's public sector, educational institutions, justice systems, transport and workplaces. This strategy will focus on the removal of institutional, cultural and financial barriers which lead to inequalities in relation to many protected characteristics, including disabilities. I've I thank you for your forbearance, Mr Deputy Speaker. We need to look at what Scotland is doing. And please, Minister, I hope you will agree uh, to a meeting with me on this. Um, a bit cheeky to ask at this point, but I do used to have regular meetings with the Disabilities Minister. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, you've heard I've given cases. Other members have given cases. We need to sort this out. This government needs to respect the UN uh, Charter on Persons with Disabilities. We need to make life better because there is a huge pool of people out there who want to work, who want to be able to live a decent life and to contribute more to society. And we need and we must, we should give them that opportunity. Annalise Dodd. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And may I also welcome the new minister to his place and, of course, thank uh, my wonderful friend, the member for Battersea, for securing this debate and for her tireless campaigning on these issues, both in this House but, of course, also for many years in civil society. And she made a typically powerful and well-evidenced speech, as, of course, did all of the other contributors that we've heard from during this debate. Very grateful to my honourable, my right honourable, sorry, friend for East Ham, uh, for all of the work, of course, that he does with his select committee, based on his extensive knowledge in this area. And also, as always, to the uh, member for Strangford for his characteristically thoughtful, detailed and humble remarks. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the many disabled people's organisations, charities and activists campaigning to improve the lives of disabled people. Next Saturday, we will be marking the International Day of Persons with Disabilities, but I, as my friends have done, will henceforth refer to that day as the International Day for Disabled People, because, as the member for Battersea has pointed out, on this side of the House, we subscribe to the social model of disability, not the medical model. Now, I wish, Mr Deputy Speaker, I could say we're all here purely to celebrate the International Day of Disabled People. There is certainly a huge amount that we must celebrate. Many members have rightly referred to the truly inspiring case of John McFall. What a wonderful week we have with that news of him potentially being the first ever disabled astronaut. There are so many others that we can mention, not least in that Disability 100 power list referred to by my honourable friend. And the fifth of Britain's population who have a disability are obviously achieving incredible things and in that connection Mr Deputy Speaker I want to associate myself with the gratitude that my honourable friend for Battersea expressed uh, for the lives of Sean McGovern and Roger Lewis. Um, I say that in the case of Sean as a Unite member um, and a trade unionist. I really want to thank both of them for all that they achieved and express our sympathies to their family and friends at their loss. There is clearly no lack of ambition amongst disabled people, but sadly they are far, far too often blocked from realising those ambitions and therefore we must not shy away from the challenges facing disabled people, which have become increasingly intense over recent years. Even before the pandemic, public service and social security cuts since 2010 fell disproportionately on the shoulders of disabled people. Since then, disturbingly, disabled people made up three in five of those who died from COVID-19 in England during the first wave of the pandemic. Successive failures in social care and social security have left disabled people more vulnerable to the health and economic consequences of the virus. 
And as my honourable friend for Battersea rightly referred to, uh, that there are so many challenges for disabled people connected to those areas and others. She mentioned challenges around transport, also around the lack of reform within social care, which disabled people have been promised so many times. And the honourable member for Motherwell and Wishaw also talked about the impact of cuts to international aid on disabled people internationally. One area which all speakers rightly referred to was disabled people's participation in the labour market. And I am concerned by recent figures here. In 2021, the proportion of disabled people either unemployed or economically inactive rose from 45.9% to 47.7%. 4 million disabled people now are locked out of work and the disability employment gap has actually been growing recently, marginally but growing, from 28.1% to 28.8%. This is unacceptable. We need to see much more action to support disabled people into and in work. And of course, we also need to see much more action around the cost of living crisis, which is impacting disabled people's livelihoods. Disabled people's ability just to eat decently, to heat their homes, to work, and often even just to access basic medication and equipment is often in peril. Uh, the charity Scope estimates that the additional cost of being disabled amounts to, on average, around £600 a month. And those calculations were undertaken before the impact of intensified price rises for different goods and services that we've seen over recent weeks. So all of this, of course, has real-life consequences for disabled people. And last month, the Office for National Statistics found that over half, 55% of disabled adults reported finding it difficult to afford their energy bills. And of course, as the member for Motherwell and Wishaw rightly said, that can have a direct impact on people's health status when they're not able to power the equipment that they need. And that compares with a lower proportion of non-disabled people who are finding it difficult to afford their bills, 40%. Over a third, 36% of disabled people, found it difficult to afford their rent or mortgage payments compared with 27% of non-disabled people. Now, the response to all of this, as many others have already said, has been to publish what was already an extremely delayed national strategy for disabled people. But as other speakers have said, that was, of course, ruled unlawful by the High Court because disabled people were not consulted on what they needed. That strategy was about disabled people without disabled people. And as my right honourable friend for East Ham rightly made clear, that engagement is not just important in order to show respect to disabled people rather than palpable disrespect, as the government was found to have shown. It's important in order to ensure that policies for disabled people will actually work, that they will be effective. Um, and I really want here to pay tribute to my a uh, friend for Lewisham and Deptford as the Shadow Minister for Disabled People for all of the work that she has done in this regard, making sure that disabled people's voices are heard. And I also want to associate myself with the remarks of the member for Motherwell and Wishaw concerning the government's approach to the Human Rights Act, which looks set to remove some other of those levers for disabled people. Now, one of the topics that was also mentioned in this debate, of course, is the incidence of hate crime directed towards disabled people. People. We are still waiting, Mr Deputy Speaker, for a new hate crime strategy, despite hate crime related to dis disability having increased more than sevenfold over recent years. So I have some questions uh, for the Minister. What is he doing to replace the national disability strategy and properly consult disabled people? How will he close the employment and wage gaps for disabled people? Will he commit to tackling hate crime perpetrated against disabled people? And what is he doing to shield disabled people from the economic crisis that is worse in our country than in so many other comparable countries, partly because of decisions made by successive recent governments? We do need to have a different approach here. The last Labour government did more to advance equality than any other government. The next one is going to build on that track record. We will work with disabled people in a spirit of dignity and respect to develop the right policies for and with disabled people. That includes, for example, saying that flexible working will be introduced by default, that we will move ahead speedily 
with disability pay gap reporting within the first 100 days of a new Labour government. And we need to do that because the disability pay gap this year showed that disabled workers earn £2.05 less per hour than non-disabled workers. Disability pay gap reporting will shine a light on this inequity and encourage employers to act to rectify it. And we're going to level that playing field for disabled people subject to horrendous hate crime, ensuring that hate crimes against them are treated as the aggravated offences that they are. It's also critical, of course, that we consider the situation for different groups of disabled people. Now, last Sunday was Equal Pay Day, the day when women essentially stop earning for the year compared to men as a result of the gender pay gap. But just as my honourable friend said, the ge uh, gender exacerbates that gap. Uh, the gender pay gap for disabled women is disturbingly high. The latest statistics collected on this subject suggest that the gender pay gap for disabled women stands at a whopping 22.1%. So their equal pay day actually would have been way back on the 12th of October when they stopped earning relative to all men. Now, nobody should face unfair and unequal pay at work, but this just shows us how disabled people are even more disadvantaged. And I want to associate myself here with the remarks made by my right honourable friend for East Ham. Transparency, both in the workplace and from government, surely is the very least that disabled people should expect. Now, tomorrow is also the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women and Girls, marking the start of 16 days of activism against that type of violence. And disabled people experience domestic abuse at double the rate of non-disabled people. During their lifetime, one in two disabled women experienced domestic violence in the UK, compared with one in four women overall. Disabled women may also experience higher rates of economic abuse and have their treatments or equipment withheld. So in the month when Equal Pay Day, international, the International Day to Eliminate Violence Against Women and Girls, and the International Day for Disabled People combine, I would also like to ask the Minister what he will do to end violence against women and girls, against disabled women, and close the pay gaps that affect them. Will the Government treat disabled people with dignity and respect? Will they fulfil their promises on flexible working to make it easier for disabled people to get to work? And will they finally bring forward a strategy for disabled people that actually consults and involves them? I look forward to the Minister's response. Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'm pleased to join colleagues in speaking in this debate to celebrate the UN International Day of Persons with Disabilities. And I would like to pay tribute and thank the honourable members for securing this debate, and particularly um, the Honourable Lady, the Member for Battersea, who opened the debate eloquently, the Honourable Member for Strangford, who I think um, highlighted eloquently and superbly the enormous contribution made by disabled people across our society in many forms, and of course to the Chairman of the Select Committee, the Right Honourable Gentleman, whom I think I've had cause to vote for previously. Um, in trying to become chairman, and it's a fact that I probably now um, reflect upon the fact that I may well come to regret um, that vote. He is an assiduous chairman of the Select Committee, and I look forward to engaging constructively with him and colleagues um, in the work that the Select Committee does in scrutinising our work as ministers in the Department for Work and Pensions. And we have heard a number of moving and very inspiring contributions reflecting the diversity of disabled people's lived experience. And I think that that is perhaps um, noteworthy in talking today about John McFall and his remarkable um, achievement, which I know all of us across this House want to commend him for and send our very best wishes. It's hugely exciting. The theme for this year's International Day of Persons with Disabilities is Transformative Solutions for Inclusive Development the role of innovation in fuelling an accessible and equitable world. It is a timely and important theme, and we aim to step up our efforts to build back better and fairer for a society that is inclusive and accessible to all. I'm going to talk about our global leadership on disability inclusion, and I'm going to give some examples of the work we are doing domestically on this year's theme. Um, I will give way to... Welcome the Minister to his place. Um, and while I'm grateful that the government supported private members' bills in the last session, like the British Sign Language, 
the Down Syndrome Act, uh, which gained royal assent. Can I ask the Minister to look at providing some priority time <coughs> to, uh, uh, within the government's own legislative programme, rather than relying on private members' bills, because measures like this are so important for people with disabilities? Well, I'm grateful to um, the Honourable Lady for raising that point, and it will speak to somewhat the points that I will go on to make um, later in the course of my remarks that I hope will give us some confidence um, around this. And we are working towards equality on the global stage through both the example we set here in the UK and our international cooperation. The UK has long provided global leadership on disability inclusion. The UK Government ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and its optional protocol in 2009. We remain fully committed to implementing this Convention through strong legislation, programmes and policies that tackle the barriers faced by disabled people in order to realise their full participation and inclusion in society. Along with Kenya, we started the Global Disability Summit Movement in 2018 and we have continued to support it providing funding to the Secretariat and advising the governments of Norway and Ghana ahead of the second summit that took place in February of this year. Most recently, the former Minister of State for Disabled People, my honourable friend, um, the member for Norwich North, attended the 15th session of the Conference of State Parties to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in June 2022. She participated in bilateral meetings and wider debates and met global counterparts with the aim of strengthening the international political commitment for the rights of disabled people. And I would like to place on record, Mr Deputy Speaker, my thanks to her for all of her work, and particularly in this week where she's announced that she will not be standing um, for re-election to this House. She has been a trailblazer for disabled people, leading that work in government, and I'm proud of the huge contribution that she has made that provide very strong foundations upon which I, along with the Secretary of State, will be building. The UK continues to support disabled people living in lower and middle income countries through our flagship disability inclusive programmes. We are also providing support to disabled people in Ukraine. I will gladly give way to the Honourable Lady. In, in his remarks, he he's, uh, talking about the UK, his government saying they support and want to ensure that they uh, continue to support disabled people going, going forward. But it has been 13 years since the last Labour government actually signed up to this convention and this current government or successive government hasn't committed to fully incorporating the convention. Now, he's saying that you are committed to it, but why is the government not seeking to incorporate it? So, for example, Article 19 of the convention around independent living for disabled people. When will the government actually commit to incorporating that into UK law? What I can say to the Honourable Lady in um, directly addressing this point is that we are fully committed to the Convention, as I've said, but as a general principle, the UK Government does not incorporate international treaties into our domestic law. However, the rights of disabled people under this Convention are largely reflected in existing domestic policies and legislation, including the Equality Act 2010 in England, Scotland and Wales, and the Disability Discrimination Act 1995 in Northern Ireland. It is, and I've said this in the context of other debates in ministerial roles that I've held elsewhere, that it's for this House, for this Parliament, to um, interpret um, our international obligations and to reflect those in our domestic legislative body, how this House and Parliament more generally sees fit. To go back to the wider points, um, the UK continues to support disabled people living in lower and middle income countries through our flagship disability inclusive programmes. And as I say, we're also providing support to disabled people in Ukraine. We are providing global leadership, but we are clear that more needs to be done. The FCDO published an ambitious disability inclusion and rights strategy to embed disability inclusion across FCO's diplomacy, policy and programming work at the Global Disability Summit in February this year. The strategy reaffirms the UK's commitment to act as a global leader on disability inclusion, setting out our approach through to 2030. The FCDO also announced 18 public commitments in February to make its international development work more disability inclusive. The commitments include increasing meaningful participation with disabled people and specific work on violence against women and girls and sexual and reproductive health and rights. The FCDO's disability inclusive development is a six-year £30 million programme designed to test what works for disabled people. 
By the end of March this year, FCDO provided more than 375 disabled children with a quality education, almost 6,000 disabled people with improved access to health care, over 6,400 people with disabilities with training and skills development to improve their income, and encouraged over 16.5 million people to change their attitudes and behaviours towards disabled people to tackle stigma and discrimination. The UK also supports the growth of the global disability movement by providing capacity building grants to disabled people's organisations around the world. FCDO funded the training of over 1,200 disability activists last year to help them advocate for disabled people's human rights and hold governments to account for progress on disability rights. A new allocation of 15 million in funding will help local responders in Ukraine and Poland support up to 200,000 of the most vulnerable impacted by Russia's invasion, including older people and those with disabilities. This will fund grassroots civil society groups to provide food assistance, water and sanitation, psychological support and childcare services alongside other emergency assistance. I would also like to take a moment to bring attention to some of the progress made by this government that has positively impacted the lives of disabled people. Our Social Security Special Rules for End of Life Bill received royal assent on the 25th of October 2022 and will enable people who are thought to be in the final year of their life to get fast-tracked access to, bis to disability living allowance, personal independence payment and attendance allowance. I'll gladly give way to him. I'm grateful. This is his first outing, so this is not the time to rough him up on anything. But <laughs> the background to this is, as, for those of us who participated, is mm. the UN report, mm. which demonstrated that as a result of austerity, there's been system systemic gross violations That's of the human right. rights of disabled people in this country. Yeah. One of the points that has been made on this side is the importance of the, the government to engage with disability organisations. Mm, yeah. Can I suggest one of them is the Preventable Harm Project run by Mo Stewart, yeah, yeah. who might be able to take him through some of those issues, particularly around the FC, WCA, mm. that actually developed the problems that we have with regard to the violation of human rights of disabled people in this country. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm grateful to the um, Right Honourable Gentleman for his intervention, and I would be very happy to meet with him um, to discuss these issues further. I am determined that, as Ministers, we will have constructive working relationships um, with colleagues across Parliament and, of course, working um, with third sector organisations and international organisations that are pertinent in this work to make sure we deliver the best outcomes possible. And I'd be very happy to have a conversation with him about the particular point that he has raised. And we also made similar changes to universal credit and employment support allowance in April this year. And I think that particular bill reflects very positively on the cross-party constructive work that has gone on previously, um, with, of course, the Honourable Lady, the Member for West Lancashire, bringing that bill to Parliament and working constructively with Ministers to deliver it. And, of course, um, my right honourable friend, the Member for Suffolk Coastal, and, of course, the Honourable Lady my right honourable friend, the member for Norwich North. Um, we also backed the BSL bill, which passed into law earlier this year. This will recognise BSL as a language of England, Wales and Scotland in its own right. It is also supported by a duty on the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions to regularly report on what each relevant government department has done to promote or facilitate the use of British Sign Language in its communications with the public. We lay regulations in the summer to allow more healthcare professionals to certify fit notes in addition to doctors. Nurses, occupational therapists, pharmacists and physiotherapists can all legally certify fitnotes, reducing the pressure on NHS doctors, particularly GPs. This followed legislative changes in the spring which removed the need for fitnotes to be signed in ink. And on World Mental Health Day in October, we announced the expansion of a joint programme by DWP, DHSC and NHS England, expenditure of £122 million to expand the provision of employment advisors in improving access to psychological therapy services across England. This voluntary service. Um, I'll gladly give way to him. I'm conscious I need to make a little bit of progress, but I will give way. So he's running through things the government is doing. Could he clarify what the government's intentions about the national disability strategy are? That was stuck in the courts in January. Does the government intend to move that forward? And if so, when? Um, I will get to that very point. It's um, one that I want to reflect on um, briefly in the course of um, my remarks. I will get there, and I hope that he will welcome what I have to say. Um, this voluntary service will recruit an additional 700 employment advisors to support people with common mental health conditions to improve their mental health, whilst also helping them to stay in or find work. 
A key priority for this government is increasing disability employment and reducing the disability employment gap, and we heard strong representations um, for that important objective across the House this afternoon. The government has a range of programmes and initiatives that are supporting disabled people and those with health conditions to start, stay and succeed in work. This includes disability employment advisors providing specialist expertise and upskilling work coaches in our job centres, schemes such as access to work and disability confident, and employment programmes such as local supported employment, where we are working in partnership with local authorities to support adults with autism and learning disabilities. As a government, we are committed to supporting all people with a disability to lead fulfilled, independent lives, and that is a mission that the Prime Minister, the Chancellor, the Secretary of State and I are determined to deliver on. We are delivering a wide range of actions that will positively impact the everyday lives of disabled people, from education to transport, from housing to leisure. We are also committed to challenging unhelpful perceptions of disabled people. All changes that can make a big difference and all changes that feed into enabling disabled people to thrive. The latest disability employment figures show an increase of 240,000 on the year and an overall increase of 2 million in work since the same quarter in 2013. Our Improving Life strategy set out the Government's goal to see a million more disabled people in work between 2017 and 2027, in line with the 2017 Manifesto commitment. The figures released for quarter 1 2022 showed that between quarter 1 2017 and quarter 1 2022, the number of disabled people in employment increased by 1.3 million, meaning the goal was met after only five years. Our goal to reduce the disability employment gap remains. We will continue to galvanise action across government and outside government to ensure we are ambitious about the employment of disabled people and people with health conditions. And it was to that end that last week I went to the Job Centre in Stratford to um, learn more about the initiative that we are rolling out across the country to deliver additional work coach time, which is designed specifically to help support um, people into work where possible, meeting those individual needs and widening the access and availability of work coach support, which I think is, is really very welcome. Um, on assistive technology, um, returning back to the theme of innovation, assistive technology is key to our ambition for the UK to be the most accessible place to <coughs> live and work. We are taking vital first steps towards our overall aim to make our country the most accessible place in the world to live and to work with technology. Advances in technology aimed at increasing disabled people's participation in society can result in trickle-down benefits for wider society. Some advances can be especially beneficial for disabled people, as I heard about at an excellent event that was held in Parliament only last week. And to capitalise on the many advances in technology, we need to translate what is cross-party political enthusiasm and the government's overarching policy commitments into well-designed, evidence-based and funded initiatives. As a first step to achieve this, we are carrying out an ATEC needs assessment. This will explore the needs, demands and impacts on the lives of disabled people and help us to better understand the market capacity for procuring and providing a tech. Also on the theme of innovation, businesses have an important role to play. Important partnerships have been formed with our disability and access ambassadors. These are senior business leaders who use their influential status to push forward improvements to the accessibility and quality of services and facilities for disabled people. New ambassadors were appointed in July 2021 and in January 2022, and in total they cover 19 private sector industries from advertising to housing, and I'm committed to working with these ambassadors to shine a light on their sectors to ensure disabled people have increased opportunities to participate in a modern, inclusive British society, and I thank the ambassadors for all the good work that they do. And I'd now just like to briefly, mindful of the um, wide uh, variety of points that have been raised during the course of the debate, just to touch on a few of them, if I may, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, on the point about um, inclusive um, and cumulative impact assessments of social security policies on disabled people, what I can say is that, in line with the public sector equality duty, the Government carefully considers the equality impacts of policies on those sharing protected characteristics. This is in line with both its legal obligations and its strong commitment to fairness. On the cost of living, we have had many debates um, about the comprehensive support that is being provided um, by this Government to help address those pressing challenges that many families um, across the country understandably feel um, at the present time. 
that help and support should be seen in the round. Um, I know, um, because I'm responsible for overseeing this, that the current latest batch of cost of living payments are being made at the present time, and I think that that is welcome support, and no doubt we'll have the opportunity to talk more about cost of living support in debates that we will have in the uh, weeks and months ahead. And on energy in particular, the Warm Home Discount Scheme currently provides around 3 million low-income and vulnerable households across Great Britain with a £150 rebate off their winter energy bill. We have extended the scheme to 2025-26, expanded the scheme to support 800,000 more households, and we have also reformed the scheme in England and Wales to provide more rebates automatically and better target households that are in fuel poverty. On the um, national disability strategy and the court judgment, um, what I can say at this stage is that the UK Government strongly disagrees with the UN inquiry's findings, and we were disappointed with the NDS ruling, which we are appealing. We continue to be fully committed to the Convention and will be publishing our response shortly. On PIP appeals and uh, work capability assessments, since PIP was introduced, we have made 4.5 million decisions, and only 4% of these have been changed after tribunal hearings. For ESA, there have been 3.3 million completed WCAs on ESA claims between October 2013 and December 2021. 3% have gone to complete an appeal of a fit-for-work decision, and 2% have been overturned. But I'm not complacent. I'm absolutely determined that we will do everything we can to ensure that we focus on quality decision making and that decisions have got right first time. Um, there was also, quite rightly, um, comments made about access to work, which is a very effective scheme in enabling people to access employment opportunities and to sustain that employment. Um, the Access to Work developed the Health Adjustment Passport, which has been rolled out across Job Centre Plus, and to support the transition from education into employment. Access to Work has delivered a passport pilot in universities. Both have received positive feedback, and we are keen to go further. That is an area that I am looking closely at, and again, if there are observations and ideas that colleagues have got, I would be keen to hear them so that I can reflect upon those as part of um, my consideration. And I know that the Honourable Lady raised the issue of taxi and private hire drivers um, and disability access um, for individuals particularly who are blind. Um, what I can say is that under the Equality Act 2010, um, private hire drivers and taxis have a duty to carry guide dogs and assistance dogs at no extra cost to the passenger. But on accessible transport more generally, officials will deliver a review of the Public Service Vehicles Accessibility Regulations 2000 by the end of 2023, which will ensure that future decisions on accessibility standards are based on an updated understanding of passenger needs. I also just wanted to touch on hate crime, because that was something that came across strongly in a number of the contributions. And I think that all of us, and I say this as someone who is a former policing minister and a former victims minister, this is an area that I feel very, very strongly about. And we must come together as one House of Commons and a society in calling out hate crime wherever we see it, in whatever form it takes. The UK Government has asked the Law Commission to review existing criminal law for harmful communications online and offline. And following the Law Commission's final report, the Government is taking forward the recommended harmful communications, false communications and threatening communications offences through the online safety bill. Just in closing, Mr Deputy Speaker, in my role as Minister of State for Disabled People, Health and Work, I am committed to continuing to drive forward the disability agenda across government, tackling the barriers that disabled people face. I will very quickly give way. I to come back to the subject of the National Disability Strategy. I wonder whether he could just tell us what the government's intentions are about, about that. Um, what I will do, if I may, because I could speak at some length on this, I think I will write to the Honourable Gentleman as the Chairman of the Committee and provide him with an update um, on where we are in relation to that particular point. I think that's the best way of addressing that today. Um, but I also just want to assure the House that I will continue to work with ministerial colleagues across government, especially as convener and the new Chairman of the Ministerial Disability Champions. The Ministerial Disability Champions were appointed in summer 2020 at the request of the then Prime Minister to help drive progress across government to improve the lives of disabled people. That commitment remains. 
The Ministerial Disability Champions meet regularly throughout the year and act as a personal lead within their respective departments, encouraging joined-up working across departments and committing to champion disabled people. And I'm keen to look at and consider and try and advance particular projects that colleagues and wider society feel would be beneficial to improving things for disabled people. I will also continue to meet with disabled people, disabled people's organisations and disability charities across the UK, so many of whom are inspirational in the work that they do and in the example that they set. Ensuring the voices of disabled people are heard is a priority for this government. We continue to work closely with disabled people and disabled people's organisations to ensure we hear from the full diversity of the community. Only this week, I've met with the Disability Charities Consortium, Disability Benefits Consortium and DPO Forum England to discuss issues impacting the lives of disabled people. And I hope that that does give reassurance to the House about my determination, my commitment and my willingness to engage thoroughly and extensively. No one person has a monopoly on good ideas about the next steps that we should take. The Disability Unit runs multiple stakeholder networks to support and supplement government's engagement with disabled people and their organisations. Departments across government also have their own networks specific to their policy focus. The unit is currently considering how we can strengthen our engagement with the sector even further. We stay cognisant of opportunities to consult and co-create with the sector in designing and delivering impactful policies to improve disabled people's lives. Our ultimate aim is to improve disabled people's lives. Ahead of this year's UN International Day of Persons with Disabilities, I wish to emphasise our ongoing commitment to drive forward inclusion for disabled people at all levels of British society and continue to be global leaders in the disability space. I know that that is a firm commitment that we share across this House. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Word for up to two minutes, Marsha de Cotova. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I firstly just congratulate all um, right honourable members that, that contributed to what I believe is an incredibly important uh, debate, particularly a timely debate, given the lived experience um, faced by so many uh, disabled people ahead of um, the UN Day on the 3rd of December. Um, I, I do have to say, and I take point from my right honourable friend, the member for Hayes, and Harlington, that he, this is a new minister and we have to be you know, constructive. Um, but I have to say, I, I would have really appreciated uh, uh, responses to many of my questions that you, you didn't respond to. But I will write, well, I hope he will write to me when he's had an opportunity to review my speech and provide me with some written answers to the questions that you, you were unable to, so the, the minister was, sorry, the minister was unable um, to cover. But nonetheless, we have celebrated the many, many achievements, but acknowledged some of the huge challenges and barriers that are still facing so many uh, deaf and disabled people. I, I also want to just allude right back to the National Disability Strategy, because it is in the courts and it has been ruled unlawful. And so the question really has to be for the minister to set out what is going to happen now. We are in a cost of living emergency. There are challenges with the social security system, with the social care system, with transport, with education, and so many other areas. So we need to actually understand what action is the government going to take now. Yeah. Yeah. The question is, as on the order papers, may I say aye? Aye. aye. I think you know. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now come to the debate on the independent review of the proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.